we're going to start getting into some of the actual anatomy itself now, talking about the head and the neck. So with the head, we're going to talk about the skull bones. In the material, I've gone ahead and added some of these sites, these Teach Me Anatomy site. I found is, is super, super helpful. It has a lot of good information on there. It has some practice questions. It has some stuff in there that is really, really good and does a good job of breaking down the material to be able to see and, and learn from it. So if you have enough time and you're studying for this, all of the information that you need to know for the boards is going to be here within this material. But if you want to truly master this material, or if you're watching this in order to help you in other courses, like in your general anatomy course, this Teach Me Anatomy is going to be is phenomenal for you. So we talk about the cranial roof, also known as the calvarium. You'll see it as uh, both of those on boards. This is the upper part of the skull. It's made up of the frontal bone, the parietal bone, and the occipital bone, and it protects the brain and forms the upper part of the cranium. The cranial base, this is the front bottom part of the frontal bone, the sphenoid bone, occipital bone, here in the blue, green, the parietal bones, and then the temporal bones right in there. Again, it's the cranial base. What we're going to also start to see within the, the skull and the facial bones, identifying which bones are paired and which bones are single. So for example, the frontal bones, pariah and parietal bones, and temporal bones are all paired bones of the skull. Whereas the ethmoid, the sphenoid, and the occipital bone are all individual bones. There's only one of them. The frontal bone forms the forehead. Parietal is on either side. The temporal bones, those are where our ears are. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. But this is where our temporalis muscle is. It's why it's called the temporalis muscle. It's one of our muscles of mastication. It goes down and connects onto the jaw. Uh, you can see a little bit of the sphenoid bone off on the side. Most of the time, we don't call a lot of attention to that, though. Then the occipital bone is making up the back of the skull in, in, the, bay, in the rear. Our ethmoid bone, this is on that anterior portion of the skull. It's right above the nose. It has this cribiform plate where the, our olfactory nerve, that is our cranial nerve, one goes directly through that to allow us to smell. So if you kind of if you look at the cribriform plate, it looks like it has a bunch. If you look at the ethmoid bone, the top of it looks like it has a bunch of holes in it, and that's where all of the little nerve fibers of the olfactory nerve, which come off of the olfactory bulb, all dive down in there to be able to pick up all the senses from our smell. The sphenoid bone, they like to ask about the sphenoid bone, and I should say this, when we talk about a lot of our bony structures, and even muscles for that matter, we want to, a, a good strategy for understanding this material and for preparing for exams in school and for boards and for life, find the most important components of those, of those structures, and make those connections. So for example, with the sphenoid bone, it has the cella tersica. The cella tersica is for the pituitary gland. So any time that we have a question regarding the pituitary gland, which can be a lot because that's a lot of our hormones, any time that we're asked, getting a question about the sphenoid bone, there's a good chance that the cella tersica, the pituitary gland, the sphenoid bone, all of those things are kind of linked together when we get asked questions. It does have a couple of other structures like the superior orbital fissure. It has the foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, which other, other structures, other nerves and other things pass through. However, um, there, it's not typically aggressively tested on. Petrous bone, this is a pyramid shaped bone of the temporal bone near the ears, rarely ever asked about in any anatomy context. The lacrimal bone, these are one of the bones 
honestly, I would consider them more facial bones. However, they do kind of make up a small portion of like the skull portion itself. So I put them in, actually put them into both categories. It's one of the smallest, most fragile bones, and it's for tear formation and secretion. We have the lacrimal gland and a little canal that goes through the, the lacrimal bone that allows excretion of, of tears. So that covers the skull. Moving on to the face, the facial bones. We have the z paired zygomatic bones, the paired maxillary bones, the paired nasal bones, the paired lacrimal bones, and then the mandible, which is non-paired. We also have the inferior nasal contra, which is its own unique bone. And then we also have the vomer and palatine bones. The vomer, they like to ask questions about the vomer. It's the single bone forming the inferior part of the nasal septum. This is the bone that when you look into a, a fully cleaned skull and you kind of see a, a triangle going upwards so it starts thin at the very very front of the nasal cavity and it moves gets bigger as it goes back right in the center dead center line that's the vomer and articulates with a bunch of the bones all through there separating the nasal cavity as far as it goes a lot of these bones i have the definition i have some key information uh, all in here there's not a lot as far as testable or memorization type material other than, hey, know the location of the bones, know if they're paired or not, and that will get you questions on all of this type of stuff. Palatine bones, the only thing that I want to point out with the palatine bones, they form that upper part of the palate. When we have issues with with palatine bones with the whole palate the, the palate as a whole and we get that cleft palate or the clefting of of palatine or of all these bones that's a specific condition that is our trisomy 13 disorder we'll see that when we talk when if you haven't watched pathology if you watch pathology already or if you're going to watch, watch pathology later that condition is going to pop up usually when we see clefting like that we're usually thinking some type of trisomy disorder. There can also be a couple of other disorders. We don't get super deep into them, but malnutrition type things and some other issues that, that can cause clefting of the palate. Suture lines. We already talked about the planes. The planes match some of the sutures. So coronal suture fits the coronal or the frontal plane. That's right here in the front. It connects with the frontal bones to the parietal bones. The sagittal suture connects the two parietal bones to each other and down the midline. So sagittal plane, coronal plane, those all line up. The lam lambdoid suture is between the parietal bones and the occipital bones. The squamous suture is between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. We also have the frontal or the metopic suture. This is most commonly talked about when talking about infants, and more along the lines of talking about the fontanelles. You see this metopic suture, this metopic line. In a fully developed skull, you don't really notice the, the metopic suture nearly as much. Finally, the zygomaticotemporal suture. Looking at the name, zygomatico, the, the, the zygomaticus bone and the temporal bone, it connects these two and forms that zygomatic arch. Can often be fractured when with uh, facial trauma. Now some, of this, some of these spots, um, is it where sutures meet or other important structures, most of these are where sutures meet. The only different one is the, the ineon, which they like to, to ask about. You have the asterion. This is where the parietal, temporal, and occipital bones all meet. Asterion, it makes up the back, the ass of the skull. The pterion, this is the frontal, parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bones all come together. So it's, it's front on the side. Way that you can remember this um, if you want to. The, 
Pterion has a silent P like pterodactyl. The sphenoid bones, this part of the sphenoid that's popping out is called the wing of the sphenoid. So the wing of the sphenoid makes up the pterion, like the, the pterodactyl. The ineon, the ineon, this is the most prominent point on the external occipital protuberance of the skull. This is on the occipital bone. This is where the nuchal ligament comes and attaches to that ineon. Lambda, this is the junction between the sagittal and the lambdoid suture at the back of the skull. You can find it here, lambda sagittal. And then bregma, which is the sagittal and coronal suture meeting point. Another little addition, wormian bones. These are the tiny bones that can form within sutures. Sometimes we get these extra little baby bones forming within uh, within the suture lines that are their own separate bones, but they don't really play. They're not important in any, any way, really. Connecting these suture meeting points with the fontanelles is a lot of times a question they like to ask. Very rarely do they ask when the fontanelles close more often it's identifying and connecting the fontanelle to the adult structure. And when I say fontanelle, I'm referring to these are the soft spots of a baby. You know, they say with a baby skull, don't squish and press on the baby skull because they have their soft spots. That is what these fontanelles are. We have an anterior fontanelle, which is where bregma is going to form. That's that coronal suture, sagittal line, and the metopic. The posterior font fontanelle is where the junction of the sagittal and the lambdoidal suture. So that was going to become the lambda. The sphenoidal fontanelles are off on the side. That's where the pterion is. The mastoid fontanelle matches up in the back with the asterion, which makes sense because our mast is right near our mastoid process. The mastoid process is there in the back of the skull. So just above that is where you're going to see the asterion. If they're going to ask you about any of them, they're going to ask about the anterior posterior connecting to bregma lambda, less likely that they'll ask about sphenoidal or mastoid fontanelles. Okay, we'll end this video right here and we'll continue on in the next one with the neck.